Hi, and welcome to the Own Your Crypto podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Olson, head of growth at Xverse, the most advanced Web3 Bitcoin wallet, where we believe in connecting the world to a more accessible, decentralized economy. If you're curious about the latest and greatest tech building on Bitcoin, you're in the right place. Each episode, we invite experts to share exciting updates about what they're working on in the ecosystem so we can share the knowledge and tools for you to own your crypto. Through casual conversations, we cover topics like blockchain technology, DeFi, financial literacy, and how to use Web3 on Bitcoin in practical ways. If you'd like to tune in live, ask questions, or join the conversation, be sure to follow Xverse on Twitter at Xverse App. Welcome, everyone, to the Own Your Crypto Show where we invite experts to share exciting updates about what they're working on in the Bitcoin ecosystem. I'm your host, Elizabeth Olson, head of growth at Xverse, the Bitcoin wallet for Web3. And today we're going to be talking about decentralized finance or DeFi as we'll refer to it moving forward. Let's take a step back to understand the DeFi big picture developments in recent years. Looking a few years back in May 2020, we had just crossed over a billion dollars in total value locked in DeFi protocols around the world. Fast forward to today, we're now over $60 billion. Now, if we take a look at DeFi market share, Ethereum by far dominates with $200 billion of assets in apps, led by protocols which you're probably familiar with, like Compound and Aave. However, If we take a look at Bitcoin, we see the market cap is far greater at $600 billion and 176 million holders, which is about seven times more than Ethereum's 23 million holders. So again, that's $200 billion with Ethereum and $600 billion with Bitcoin. But despite Bitcoin being the first crypto and still largest crypto by market value, DeFi is mostly not built on Bitcoin until recently, as we'll be discussing some solutions for this. We've brought in an all-star lineup of Bitcoin DeFi thought leaders and builders in this space here to share with you firsthand why investors are now looking to Bitcoin DeFi and how new technology is making this possible. So here with us, we have Chante Su from Alex, Philip Smet from ArcDeco, Aki Belo and Jesse Eisenberg from DLC Link, Tycho Nash from Zest Protocol, and of course, our very own founder, Ken Lau from Xverse. So let's go ahead and kick it off with a quick round of introductions, just a few short seconds for everybody and perhaps the taglines, if you will, behind your protocols. Chiante, welcome. Thank you, Elizabeth, and hope everyone is well. I am the CEO and co-founder of AlexGo. Alex stands for Automated Liquidity Exchange. What is Alex? Alex's vision is achieve financial freedom through Bitcoin, and it is our goal. Whoever holds Bitcoin should earn Bitcoin. And that's the very reason why we decided to come to build on Stacks. Excellent. It's wonderful to have you. Philip. Hello, I am Philip, core contributor at Arcadico. We are a crypto collateralized stablecoin. Specifically, that means you can put in your crypto. That is today STX and XBTC. And very soon, also AT Alex, the auto compounding Alex governance token. You can put those tokens in a smart contract and mint our stablecoin USDA against us. So effectively, you're leveraging yourself against your crypto, additional liquidity without selling it. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Aki. Hey, everyone. I'm Aki, co founded DLC Link. We're letting native Bitcoin be used in applications on any chain using Bitcoin escrow system enabled by discrete log contracts or DLCs. And last but not least, Tycho. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks very much. I'm Tycho and co-founder of Zest Protocol. And what we're building is the first sort of native Bitcoin on-chain yield product. So you can earn yield on your Bitcoin. And what happens under the hood is that Bitcoin gets lent to some of the most creditworthy institutions in crypto to generate a sustainable yield, doing yield-bearing activity with it on centralized exchanges in the real world. Happy to have all of you here. And we have many questions and we'll also try to save time for a Q&A at the end. To start, for each of you, I'd like to get your take on what is DeFi? Sure. DeFi stands for decentralized finance. And what's important here, decentralized, right? And the way we define this word decentralization, there are many different definitions, obviously from math to philosophy to computer science to economics. But the way we understand it is that there's no single point of centralized authority that will be the decision maker to shut the participant. So that's what we believe is a decentralized finance. Now, 
One thing I want to make clear because we are here, most of us are builders on stacks, Bitcoin via stacks. And one thing I want to make it clear is our belief that Bitcoin doesn't need DeFi. Bitcoin is a perfect layer of money, big database. So Bitcoin doesn't need DeFi. But we truly believe, particularly at Alex, we truly believe that DeFi does need Bitcoin. Bitcoin exists years before DeFi emerged, and the Bitcoin will remain if DeFi ever disappear. But DeFi, however, do need Bitcoin. Why? Because without the security and the immutability unique to Bitcoin, DeFi will never achieve mass adoption. Most of the public, they don't hold and they don't understand Bitcoin at all. To go from being a newcomer to crypto to participating in Bitcoin DeFi, it takes a few steps, right? And we like to call it steps one, two, three, but this is very specific to Alex, but feel free to adapt to your own protocol. Number one is Bitcoin is a money layer. It's the ultimate form of money. If you ask somebody, say, okay, you are not happy with the current fiat system, write down everything you don't like, and then write down everything that you would like. It turned out that everything, every point will lead to Bitcoin. That's how beautiful this protocol is. So it's the ultimate form of money. Because Bitcoin is truly in security, ours, yours. Now, the whole purpose of Alex come to build on Stack is that Stack is a smart country layer. Just like you said, Elizabeth, all the thriving DeFi at the moment are on Ethereum, on Solana, on other chains. But Stacks enable the smart country layer on Bitcoin. Stacks makes Bitcoin programmable money. We should keep on saying this over and over again because I feel like most people don't understand it. Alex is a protocol built on stacks, built on Bitcoin, set on Bitcoin via stacks. So Alex protocol turns Bitcoin into a productive asset. What does that mean, productive asset? If you hold Bitcoin, you should earn Bitcoin. And that's really the beauty. I always like to say this is genius. POX is genius. When you use a network like Stacks, a smart contract layer, and you can earn, when you stack, you can earn Bitcoin. That's the beauty of Stacks. And Alex is here to offer the Bitcoin yield to all Bitcoin holders that make your Bitcoin to earn the yield, completely decentralized way. That's such a great point that in order for DeFi to achieve this mass adoption, we really need the security and immutability that only Bitcoin can provide. Taiko, anything to add or expand on that? Why would you want to do DeFi with Bitcoin and maybe not with other assets? I think the simple answer is because it's Bitcoin and Bitcoin has some real world use cases today. And I guess we're all believe that it will have more of those in the future. And if there's such a thing as a Bitcoin economy, or if Bitcoin is money, right, then there has to be a Bitcoin economy with people and businesses that have earnings in Bitcoin and that spend in Bitcoin. And once you have people and businesses that have earnings in Bitcoin, you also have people and businesses that have future earnings in Bitcoin. And they might want to bring those to the present to grow their activity and whatever it is that they are doing. That's my thesis why it will be very critical for Bitcoin to have under collateralized lending or borrowing layers so that participants in the Bitcoin economy can actually bring their future earnings to the present and invest it in what they're doing, which is in many ways the basis of civilization today or why we are sitting here on our smartphones or computers and are able to communicate across the world and, and all of that stuff. Now, what makes Stacks uniquely positioned to enable Bitcoin DeFi is in essence that if you write the Clarity Smart Contract on Stacks, you have read access to Bitcoin state via the Stacks nodes. So I guess all the Stacks nodes, like all together, kind of function as a big oracle for Bitcoin state. Where Bitcoin is, you know what it does. Bitcoin doesn't know Stacks, but Stacks knows Bitcoin, right? That's the only chain. And then you can basically do DeFi that responds to Bitcoin transactions. So someone sends a Bitcoin transaction to another person, and then you trigger something on Stacks, or you keep account on Stacks of what's going on. And that's something that's unique to Stacks because of the proof of transfer consensus mechanism. Because people are sending in Bitcoin to mine the next Stacks block, all the nodes need to know where this Bitcoin has arrived and then you could reuse this sort of feature for DeFi because like then suddenly these simple peer-to-peer transactions on Bitcoin start becoming loans or payments for digital goods and so on and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Super exciting. And I see also Jesse from DLC Link was able to join. Aki is also here. I'd like to come to you with some definitions, if you may. What is wrapped Bitcoin and why do Ethereum DeFi apps rely on this despite its centralized nature? And really being counter to the ethos of decentralization. 
Yeah, so basically a Bitcoin chain is not interoperable with Ethereum or other chains. It's standalone by design. And so in order to bridge, I don't want to say anything ill about it, but essentially there was a sort of like a workaround maybe. Brat Bitcoin was created a couple of years ago. And the idea is basically you take your Bitcoin, you send it to a custodian, BitGo, and they hold on to it and they give you a token that is a receipt. They're storing some Bitcoin for you and then you can use that token on Ethereum. And that started as just, like I said, a workaround, but it's really grown to be the predominant form of using Bitcoin on Ethereum, which is a problem for everyone because it's not from a computer science standpoint, it's not a sound way to do things. And my take is that it's not going to scale really well. It has already scaled to over $5 billion of value. So in its own right, it's a business that is growing. But when you look at the total market cap of Bitcoin, even if you subtract the amount of Bitcoin that is presumably lost or is not actively used, there's probably, right now it's about 2%, but there's probably no more than like 3% of all Bitcoin is wrapped. And so there are other forms of wrapped Bitcoin. There are different bridges that give you tokens that show you that something is in custody, but that's basically the way to use Bitcoin on ETH DeFi right now. I assume there's probably also some risk there since it's no longer native Bitcoin, you're entrusting this. Yeah, exactly. The big draw of Bitcoin versus other digital currency like USDC, the big draw of Bitcoin is that it's censorship resistant and you lose that benefit immediately when you wrap it in that way. And let's circle over to Philip. What do you see as the current bottleneck here for Bitcoin DeFi? First, let me say that I'm obviously super bullish on Stacks, right? As the reason we start building on it, lots of potential. I love the angle of Bitcoin. We're all Bitcoiners here. And we came not because of mercenary money or anything, but just because of our thesis. But to your question, I do think it's both the technology and the competition. And let me illustrate that with an example. So if I go to, let's say, what we call a normie, layman who doesn't really know crypto, they never really use it. And I go to them and I give them one ETH, the equivalent in Sol and the equivalent in Stacks. I'm like, do any on-chain transaction, go work with a protocol, whether that's Alex, Arcadico on Stacks or something else, maybe an NFT marketplace and do the same on Ethereum and Solana. They usually, and I've done this with more than 10 people, they come back to me and they're like, bro, I have to wait for 30 minutes for my transaction to even do something. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because it's connected to Bitcoin and you go with the whole pitch, right? But these people, they don't care so much about decentralization. They care about cool products. They care about great communities. They care about fantastic UX and all those things. And so I believe, obviously, I'm going to hyperchains. We need that. And so that's the technology part. I believe decentralization also doesn't really matter until we're at Solana levels of speed. We need to fly with stacks. And I don't think the normies will come unless we fix that. And obviously, I think the optionality having the decentralization is amazing. You can just go from like fairly decentralized on the anchor level, on the base level of stacks, all the way to like hyper chains, which are super fast and immediately sell your transactions. Another thing that I want to say is I want to see more velocity in the money, meaning in stacks and BTC. I don't want to hodl my BTC. I think number of holders, by the way, is a terrible metric. I think we need to look at velocity. And I think I don't really actually have data, but I believe that's a lot lower than Ethereum or Solana. And that's something that I hope Stacks will fix. And last but not least, I think most of you are, a lot of you will know Peter Thiel and maybe have read his book, Zero to One. I believe that's a great framework to look at this. So I think we're still going from one to N, which is catching up with other chains. We have amazing NFT projects. We have a stable coin or multiple. We have DEXs, some lending borrowing. But we don't have amazing oracles. We don't have fast settlement. We don't have those hyper chains. So that's part of the one to N. And I believe hinting at what Taiko and Aki already did is the native BTC angle. And for me, that's the zero to one thing. If we don't have a zero to one, we might be at M plus one, but it won't matter. We need that catalyst, that novel app that other chains don't have. And that could be the Bitcoin thing, or it could be something else, but more innovation. And I love the DLC link angle, and we're also working on that. So that's my take. Might be a little bit negative, but we need to be critical and we need some criticism in the inner space to get better. Having said that, still super bullish on the stacks and the angle of it. That's how I see it. Fantastic. So I'd like to dive in a little bit deeper into each of your protocols just to learn more about the solutions that you're currently bringing to the table. Chante, 
what can people do with Bitcoin today and what is Alex building? So instead of starting having the laundry list of what we have, I would like to start with really ultimately why Alex is here. Again, we want the Bitcoin holder to earn Bitcoin. We want Bitcoin to be able to earn yield if you hold it. But how do we do that instead of centralized land borrow entity or centralized exchange? And that's what Alex is for. And everything we have built so far and we come to build is to enable this, just one utility, right? It's very simple. You don't need to go to a very complicated stuff, whatever this and that. Very simple. On Alex, end of the year, if you have Bitcoin, you will be able to earn Bitcoin yield. And hopefully, and that's why we work quite closely with the experts, with Ken, shout out to this uh, wonderful CEO and uh, the team. Very soon, once the functionality is there, that's through Alex, if you have Bitcoin, you can earn Bitcoin yield. Hopefully we can see experts like my mom or my mother-in-law, they download the experts, they can see their Bitcoin every day, the accumulation of the yield right through the experts. So that's the, ultimately, that's the vision we have. But how do we do that? Number one, we need to have all the bits and pieces, all the functionality, I call it building blocks. So at the moment, Alex is rolling out order book. So you can call it EYDX on stack. We need to get, as Philippe said, the velocity going. We need to really offer top-notch UI, UX and order book for people who want to come to Alex, to Stacks, to Bitcoin DeFi, and they want to trade. And that's what Alex order book is about. It's very sleek. If you don't have the chance yet, please sign up to join our testnet. You can put the limit order later. You can do leverage trade, et cetera, et cetera. We need this piece in order to get the velocity going. People to come to say, oh my God, it is not a 10 minutes block time. I have to wait till I grow my gray hair. Is that the confirmation on Alex order book is instantaneous, but the settlement, it is still on Bitcoin. So that's number one. Once we have that, the next step for us is the perpetual futures between Bitcoin and stacks. Because at the end of the day, we are building on stacks, right? But the Bitcoin holder, when they want to earn Bitcoin yield, most of them don't want to take the risk between stacks and Bitcoin. So what we're going to do is the following. Alex will handle the conversion from the Bitcoin to stacks, and then we will stack the stacks in order for the Bitcoin holder to earn the stacking yield. Now, Alex will also have the perpetual futures to hedge out the risk and ultimately return the native Bitcoin yield from stacking, but also at the maturity, return your Bitcoin principle, so not stacks. So that's really single most important use case that the people will come to Alex or come to stack to earn some extra yield. Now, I understand what Aki talked about, red Bitcoin, and Philip talked about native Bitcoin. What I heard, and I hope to read that white paper very soon, is that the top-notch engineers in the stacks ecosystem are working towards the Bitcoin packout issue. And I want to say, whatever Alex is doing, again, this is our philosophy. Instead of sitting there, counting our fingers, waiting for everything in the world to be perfect, in order to do something, we want to be pragmatic. At the moment, that problem is not solved. And I hope to see DLC to thrive to solve the first step of problem. But ultimately, red Bitcoin on stack is not like red Bitcoin on ETH. So don't think red Bitcoin is dirty word, okay? Now, if red Bitcoin on other chain, it maintains only the asset value of Bitcoin but you lose network, right? You can confirm the provenance or settlement on the Bitcoin that was wrapped permissionlessly. So if we have certain wrap point on top of a stack that can directly reference to the actual original Bitcoin asset on the Bitcoin chain, we already have a huge step ahead. Think about what just mentioned by Philip, the velocity. Think about the market cap of wrapped Bitcoin. We're not even talking about Bitcoin, right? It's 5 billion. Right. If we can bring this into the stack system, I think we have achieved a huge step ahead. No, thank you, Shanti. That's such a good point. This key to unlocking so much of DeFi and bringing this to stacks through these solutions. Super exciting. Aki, what possibilities are you working on over at DLC Link? What kind of solutions are you looking for to also open up Bitcoin DeFi? 
So the infrastructure we're building lets users lock Bitcoin in an escrow in their own wallet to use that value elsewhere. And that really enables a great usability improvement. Right now, anytime you want to use your decentralized Bitcoin anywhere else, you have to send it to a bridge or send it to another address or swap it for a wrapped token. And those are your only options. Or you send it to a custodian and then you use it within the custodian systems. Any of those options, you've lost the decentralized nature of your Bitcoin. So what a DLC lets you do is you actually, DLC is an escrow where you just lock it in and you can use that Bitcoin as collateral anywhere else. And so this aligns perfectly with the idea of generating Bitcoin yield in various ways. And in fact, from a DLC perspective, you can use that Bitcoin on stacks or on any chain. So we're looking to see, I think we're going to see a marketplace of Bitcoin yield products emerge that generate yield in various ways. Stacks, to Chente's earlier point, Stacks has some technological advantages that are going to set it apart. So our development has been a little more native to Stacks and we can take advantage of Stacks consensus layer in multiple ways, which is really exciting. Super exciting. Yeah, thanks for explaining that. Philip, if you don't mind, let's circle over to you. What kind of developments is Arcadico working on with DLC Link? Yep, certainly. So I think I spoke to Aki, Jesse, and the team, I think six months ago for the first time. They're like really baller guys. I love the attitude, love working with them. And so I was like, hey, let's try something. And there were conversations of building a Bitcoin native stablecoin. I know a lot of people hinted at that. That's actually not what we're doing. I'm sorry to disappoint some of you. <laughs> it's not what we're doing. Uh, we're focusing on USDA for the time being as our only stablecoin that we're developing. However, we are doing something really cool, in my opinion, with a DLC link, which is native BTC lending borrowing, which allows you to lock your Bitcoin, your native Bitcoin, your non-wrapped Bitcoin, so Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain in a DLC and borrow stable coins against that. And so that's a prototype, don't really have a timeline, but I'm pretty excited about the developments. And yeah, I think that's going to really create a peer-to-peer -peer lending and borrowing market on stacks together with Bitcoin. And I believe more people in the ecosystem should look at that. And if you do have any questions related to the functionality or whatever, happy to help. Or Jesse or Aki can probably explain as well, as they've been very closely involved. And did you want to add anything also to dive deeper into what Arcodico is working on, just so our listeners can check it out? I said in the intro in the beginning a bit that we're mostly focused on our stablecoin and what I want to give people. So for me, DeFi is really about trustlessness, transparency, openness, availability for everyone, not based on where you live, where you were born or how much money you have. If I go to my bank and I say I have a Bitcoin, can I borrow against? They laugh and they say go away. And that's frustrating for people. And I wanted to fix that with Arcadico. So that's why we built a stablecoin. Essentially, it's a borrowing product, right? You put in some Bitcoin and you get your stablecoin out. And you can use that stablecoin in whichever shape or form you want as long as you pay it back. And the payback is guaranteed through over collateralization. So you always want your collateral back at some point because you put a more dollar value than you're actually borrowing. So it's very effective. And so honestly, that's really what I'm focused on. I just want to put that in the market, scale it up further. I know it's boring answers. We're not doing building them new products every year. No, that's not what we're doing. I really want that stablecoin to work. And then we're focusing around that stablecoin. So for instance, if you put your Bitcoin in a DLC, you will be able to borrow USDA against that. And so in some shape or form, USDA will always be central to our vision. Having said that, we did build a little product called the Keepers Network, and this allows you to automate some smart contract functionality, meaning imagine you need to farm something every two weeks or so. You don't really want to think of that always. You just want that to be automated and automatically broadcasted as a transaction on chain. So with our Keepers product, which we'll probably be launching before the end of the year on Mainnet, we are already using it internally, in fact, to do some Arcade Eco jobs. And now I believe the Lydium protocol is also integrating it. So yeah, that's something that we have launched internally as well. And we will do these small experiments, but we'll probably be focused on the boring stuff, which is just trying to make our stablecoin work, growing that and making sure that we do allow people to access that in a trustless and transparent way. Absolutely. And that's really what DeFi is all about, having these traditional banking services, but making them trustless and decentralized peer-to-peer -peer transactions and really accessible for anyone who has access to the internet. So it's 
really fantastic. Tycho, can you talk to us about Zest Protocol? Happy to shed some light on that in terms of the sort of trinity or collection of different products. If we really nail this tokenized Bitcoin on stacks, then you could borrow really effectively against your Bitcoin collateral with Arcadico. You could borrow stable coins or you could do like a lot of cool stuff on Alex with it. But the question that we set up to solve was a bit of a different one, which is more about like Bitcoin credits or Bitcoin capital markets in a bit of a broader sense, maybe, which is that if you look at like traditional finance, say 95% of the loans are under collateralized, right? If you look at like corporate bonds or very profitable companies borrowing money, they borrow that without putting any collateral, which makes sense because they're borrowing that against their future earnings. And if there's like this Bitcoin economy really exists or starts to flourish, there'll be actors who would want to borrow against their future earnings. And credits or that kind of type of credit will always be based on something, some information that's by default not public. It's in the word credit. Credo means I believe in Latin. So it's like, how do you judge that? And then there are like experts that are very good at credits. And uh, and they're basically called, yeah, we call them pool delegates that basically run a pool and they decide, hey, who would borrow from this pool based on off-chain credit assessment? So in that sense, we're working towards basically this sort of large group of different pool delegates that all compete with each other on who is the best at underwriting credit or doing credit. And in that sense, companies that have future earnings in Bitcoin, say market makers that borrow Bitcoin to do arbitrage or miners that could borrow Bitcoin and and grow their mining operations, like they could basically borrow in the asset that they have their future earnings in, which really solves all these kind of problems that you have now with miners who are basically getting into big trouble because they've borrowed a lot of fiat, they've borrowed a lot of dollars, and suddenly the Bitcoin price is down and the price of borrowing those dollars is very expensive because they have this kind of mismatch between what they pay, which is fiat for their electricity and machines and stuff, and they earn Bitcoin. If you're a market maker, you can borrow Bitcoin on Zest and you can then use that Bitcoin on Alex, for example, to do some really sophisticated trading strategies, or you could put it on Arcadico to borrow some stable coins against it for some other strategies and uh, yeah, really complete the full picture of what you can do on stacks with Bitcoin. Or you can just put on Alex and earn Bitcoin yield. That's actually one of the questions I wanted to ask is what is the difference between Alex and Zest Bitcoin yield? Is there a difference? We use a stacking yield. You stack your stacks, you get a Bitcoin yield. But if you're a Bitcoin holder, you have the exchange rate risk between Bitcoin and stacks. And Alex is through a smart contract will hedge out this exchange risk. So Bitcoin holder will get a Bitcoin yield, but we also get a Bitcoin principle. As simple as that through stacking yield. Yes. On this, how the yield is generated is that it's basically, it's a company or an entity that takes this Bitcoin to earn more Bitcoin with it. And the primary activity that exists today is to do arbitrage trading. So some of the most sophisticated market makers, they have very good strategies for moving money across centralized exchanges. And that way they're able to generate a yield. And that's basically the actors who Zest Protocol or the Zest Protocol pools will end up lending to. Wonderful. Thanks to you both for clarifying that. And just to continue with Tycho, can you explain to us some of the mechanics of how it operates, for example, with pool delegates? Yeah, for sure. It's helpful to understand a little bit as well how Bitcoin lending in general works today if you would want to borrow Bitcoin somewhere, if you like Citadel, one of these big market makers. So what they would do is they would say, go to a block file. Genesis or Galaxy Digital, and then they just basically agree on terms and they sign a master loan agreement and they get the Bitcoin to do these activities with. And the kind of volume of Bitcoin that that is getting borrowed, if you would look at the Genesis quarterly reports, it's probably around, say, 20 billion or something. And that's basically how this works today. Now, this created like a lot of problems, like as we saw a few months ago, because no one really knows, okay, if I put my money on BlockFi, who are they lending to? It's a black box and you just need to hope that it goes well and then it doesn't go well, often how these things go. And then how Zest creates like the next iteration of this is by basically decentralizing this process and making it fully transparent. So instead of putting your Bitcoin into BlockFi and then hoping you basically see an overview of different delegates that are all credit experts. And then you can see, okay, who are these people lending to? What rates are they earning? What are their default rates? Like all of those things. And based on that, you can make a decision. Okay, I would allocate to this pool or, or to that pool. Or even in a further future, you would just allocate to something that just does that automatically and moves it in between pools based on performance and stuff like that. Yeah, but it's basically like... BlockFi and Celsius were, were basically providing a very important service for the Bitcoin economy, which means that you can actually borrow this asset to do stuff with, such as make sure that it's liquid on exchanges, you can buy and sell it and stuff like that. But now all those credit lines are gone and they yeah, they would need to be rebuilt in some way for the crypto economy to succeed. And yeah, we're trying the next iteration of this. And how can somebody become a pool delta? Yeah, those are very good points. 
initially we'll probably start with say one or two delegates that are like very good that for example haven't had any defaults in this past sort of bloodbath that we saw over the last four months and then as it progressively decentralizes in the end this would be something that the token holders basically govern and uh, probably there'll be like some sort of specialized committee that's very good at credit and that sort of understands the different strategies to decide who pool delegates could be but yeah in essence zest is just the infrastructure right so if someone opens a pool or gets to be a pool delegate, and that pool doesn't perform well, then that only affects people that have led into that pool. One pool can go totally bust, and when there are hundreds of pools, that doesn't really matter. But obviously at the start, it's going to be really important that the default rate is minimized, and that there are only these really good pool delegates that have like really good past performance. Thank you for sharing the details on that. It's really exciting to hear all of these various developments. And I do have some more questions for our speakers, but wanted to also save time to bring up our listeners for Q&A. So if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll get to you soon in just a few moments. And in the meantime, Ken, we've talked a lot about how the Stacks ecosystem is really maturing in the applications being built and what's to come. What do you see as the impact this will have on the Stacks ecosystem and bringing this kind of technology and protocols to experts users? Yeah, sure. So I'm super excited just hearing all these developments that are happening with the various projects that we have here today. Very bullish for the next year or two for Stacks. And I think what this does for users is it'll open up many different choices for users to invest and earn a yield. So right now, users can hold their Stacks tokens and earn a yield through stacking. But with projects like Alex, Zest, DLC... Arcadico, there's going to be many more choices for users to earn a yield. And I think it's going to be huge that we can unlock this $400 billion of Bitcoin capital. And there's 170 million plus holders of Bitcoin. And all that Bitcoin is essentially just sitting there right now and not doing much. And if we're able to put this Bitcoin to use, that's going to be a huge unlock. And I couldn't agree more on Chante's point on needing great UX in this ecosystem because I think for most people, DeFi is still very complicated. And if you look outside the crypto space, if you wanted to invest in, say, stocks or equities, a lot of people don't have the time to do research on individual companies to figure out what stocks are good to invest in. But there are choices like index funds where people have figured out the math for you and you can just put it into the index fund and it'll grow. You don't have to think too much about it and you're insulated from the risk of investing in individual companies. So I actually wanted to ask the speakers here today, will we see something like an index fund for Bitcoin yield in the near future? I think the index fund has had his good run over the past two decades. But I don't think it's going to work in this business cycle or this economic cycle. If you think about over the past 20 years or so, on the average, if you just invest in an index fund, which is very low fee and very liquid, that's why people like it, on the average, you gain 10%, right? But not anymore. If you look at the current macro environment, the low interest rate is definitely gone. And the reason why index fund work is because of the low interest rate. Now, all the equity valuation was very high. You get this 10% plus growth across the board that it works. Actually, I don't think it's going to work over the next, I would say, at least three to five years. So I just want to give a word of warning. If you want to really make your money work, I think the 100% diversification is not going to be the magic formula anymore. And that's why I think that the investors should be very interested in the Bitcoin, in crypto, good project like the ones who are here, my co-speakers, these good projects, and try to concentrate a little bit of your bet. So that's number one, my one cent of the index fund. But I know what you mean, Ken, about index fund. You are talking about aggregation, automated weighting of different yield generation, yield generating strategies across stacks. Yeah, definitely. And I think the builder should come, right? How can we attract people to come to Stacks to use this network and to utilize the protocols? It will be really the number one common goal of all the builders here and the listeners here. 
So again, listeners, if you wanted to come up to the stage for a quick Q&A, feel free to raise a hand and we'll go ahead and bring you up. In the meantime, to our speakers, where can people go learn and connect with you guys? We need everybody to come, really. If we are talking about decentralization, permissionless Web3, you are Alex's team. You are Alex's contributors. So come and help us to test. And we are on Discord. Otherwise, we are on Twitter. And again, thank you for including us. I'm really excited. And I don't say this very often. I think Stack is the best community. I know there's a lot of things we don't have yet. Other people's garden are greener. And please come to tell us what we do well, what we don't do well. As Monif said, we either succeed together or we die together. And I would like us to succeed together. Thank you. Absolutely. I've actually myself only been in the space a few months and I've just been blown away by the incredible inclusivity and talent and really, I think, strength and diversity that Stack's ecosystem has to bring. So Aki and Jesse, can you tell us where we can go learn more about DLC Link? Yeah, you can follow us, DLC underscore link on Twitter, or just go to our website. You can go to documentation docs.dlc.link. And also, we're going to have an offer where we're letting developers get 10 free API calls to power five DLC escrows, open and closing. But reach out on Twitter, or you can email us, api at dlc.link. Awesome. And thanks for those who are raising your hand. We're about to get to you. But real quick, Tycho, can you tell us where we can learn more about Zest? So uh, it's at Zest Protocol on Twitter here. And yeah, we don't have that much information out just yet. Our contracts are already in audit and past the first audits, but everyone can go and test very soon. Uh, so we've been working pretty hard on that. But yeah, that's the place where you can find out more. You can also leave your email on zestprotocol.com and then you'll uh, be notified once there is cool stuff to see. Super. All right. So let's open up the stage for a quick Q&A. Thank you so much, guys. I would really be curious to hear from all of you speakers about the adoption of Bitcoin DeFi and especially on the institutional side, because I can imagine that there's a lot of institutions that are interested in uh, buying Bitcoin and they probably already have some, they're holding it and they should be pretty interested in earning some yield, especially if we're talking about, let's say, some low risk type of setup here. Do you see any use cases or do you have any specific comments on this? Yeah, absolutely. Since the collapse of many of those centralized land borrower entities, we have gotten a lot of inquiries about earning Bitcoin through a completely sovereign, decentralized and transparent way through smart contract. So definitely. Again, if you look at very conservative institutions like BlackRock a few years ago, telling all their clients don't touch crypto, but now really through demand because their client want to be exposed, their institutional clients want to be exposed to crypto, I definitely would say yes, the institutional interest on Bitcoin and particularly on Stack is really increasing. The other part of this is when institutions move Bitcoin or send it to a bridge, it generates a taxable event. So that is a challenge in addition to the risk of having a custodian hold it and the losses that can be incurred. So that's why we feel that letting Bitcoiners earn yield directly from their wallets is going to be a scalable solution for institutions as well. We have time for one more question. I would like to ask, how do you think regulation will impact DeFi and what will set Bitcoin apart from the other ecosystem in regards to that? I'm happy to briefly comment on that one. I think the interesting thing is that Bitcoin is the digital asset where it's clearest that it's not a security and where it's also the clearest that it cannot easily be controlled. So what we see with stable coins is that they have this sort of blacklist feature, right? So your USDC can be frozen, essentially, similar with USDT. And with Ethereum and the upcoming merge, it still remains to be seen, right? What will happen when people might ask or governments might ask some of the largest staking nodes, such as a Coinbase and so on, to basically censor blocks, right? Because when a proof of stake for creates a new block, then they, in essence, verify the whole state of the chain. Whereas when a miner is mining, they just basically delegate their hash power somewhere to a mining pool, which just works in a fundamentally different way. Bitcoin is the most censorship resistant and it will stay like that. I think this is an excellent question. And I think all of us here who are builders, we have to be very aware of those regulatory environments, right? I think the regulation, the ultimate goal of regulation are twofold. 
Number one is to protect the retail investors because by nature you want to protect those mom and pops. They are not that knowledgeable about certain securities or financial investments, but you want to protect them. So that's number one goal. The second goal is about systemic risk. You don't want certain financial security or institution has such an intertwined relationship with other financial institution that suddenly it could be the cause of systemic risk. Really, ultimately, these are the two goals of the regulators. Now, the second one is very easy to answer because DeFi will never cause any systemic risk. But C5, yes, centralized institution, yes. And that's where the regulators will go. And actually, they are doing it right now to try to regulate as much as possible, starting with stable coins. If you look at those three biggest stable coins, they are completely centralized, but they are not transparent. So they have the sweet spot of both worlds. They are acting like a money market fund, but they are not regulated at money market. Big red flag there. But this has nothing to do with DeFi, right? Whatever Tycho, Aki, Ken, Philip are building here right now is DeFi. It's completely decentralized smart contract that doesn't belong to anybody. The developers put those smart contracts on the blockchain for people to use peer-to-peer. So there's zero systemic risk. Now, to protect the mom and pop or so-called retail investors, I think we all have to do better in this. That lies in information, transparency, and education. And we need to do better, all of us together. Thank you so much, Chante, and everyone today. This is such a perfect way to wrap things up. If Bitcoin DeFi is new to you, it's definitely a good idea to get started by downloading Xverse, available on iPhone and Android, and soon desktop. You can acquire some stacks, Bitcoin, Citicoins, and other SIPTown tokens. Use the in-app browser to directly connect and interact with DeFi protocols built on stacks that you've heard about today. And as always, Xverse welcomes feedback on how we can improve. So please feel free to join our community and get in touch on ways we can make the app even better for you. So thanks again to everyone for joining us. Stay tuned and see you next time. This has been the Own Your Crypto podcast brought to you by Xverse. Our intention with this podcast is to empower you to take charge of your crypto with confidence and get excited for the future of self-custodial finance. If you enjoyed the conversation, please leave us a rating so more people can discover the show and feel free to share with a friend who's also curious about the future of Bitcoin. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll connect with us on Twitter at XFirstApp and see you next time.